funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. It's a well-known fact that people from the island of Ireland get around. For generations, people have been leaving Ireland for opportunities and experiences in new cities, countries or even continents. Some return after a few years of adventure, while others settle down abroad, with some of their descendants even becoming presidents of the United States. For believe it or not, a whopping 22 of the 45 US presidents to date claim some degree of Island of Ireland heritage. From Andrew Jackson and Ulysses S. Grant in the 19th century, to JFK and Barack Obama in more recent times. I am deeply honoured to be your guest in the free parliament of a free island. Hello, Ireland! My name is Barack Obama of the Moneygall Obamas. And I've come home to find the apostrophe that we lost somewhere along the way. In the seven-part Ring the White House series, we're going to investigate the island of Ireland ancestry of various US presidents, with a key focus on the ancestral homesteads and locations linked to them in Ireland. We begin our odyssey in Carrickfergus, County Antrim, where the parents of the 7th US President Andrew Jackson used to live, before they eventually emigrated to the Carolinas in 1765. To find out about President Jackson's County Antrim roots, I visited the Andrew Jackson Cottage, which is situated in Bonnie before Carrickfergus, County Antrim, and talked with tour guide Graham Walton. Our sort of earliest records of the Jackson family in this area date back to the early 1700s. Um, we are aware of Hugh Jackson, who would have been Andrew's grandfather. He was a linen draper and farmer who would have lived probably three, four miles north of here. Andrew's father had was the third son of Hugh. Um, obviously, probably had to find his own way in life. Um, he arrived in this area at Bonning before. We think as a farm labourer, um, possibly to become a farmer himself at some stage. We're not ex- entirely sure just exactly the year he would have arrived in Bonnie before. Right, which is just a stone's throw from Carrick Fergus, which is just down the way. And okay, uh, Hugh Jackson, Andrew Jackson, the president's grandfather, he has three sons. One of them is Andrew Jackson, yes, senior, senior, obviously. And now he's born in the 1730s, uh, am I correct? Yeah, he's born in the 1730s, yes. So um, Andrew Jackson, senior, uh, grows up in this area, son of Hugh Jackson. Uh, what happens? Who does he marry? How do things go for him? He marries. Elizabeth Hutchinson, um, they set up home in this in Bonnie before and take the decision eventually to emigrate to America. In uh, around the 1760s? In around 1760, 1765. Many people from this area would have migrated out there. Um, part of the reason being Arthur Dobbs was governor of the Carolinas. Arthur Dobbs would have been a, a local landed gentry from the area the Dobbs family still live here Dobbs Castle again just three five four miles sort of north east of here um, Dobbs encouraged many of the people from this area to migrate particularly to the Carolinas Arthur Dobbs who had been the mayor of Carrick Fergus in County Antrim Arthur Dobbs got a, a tract of land in Carolina he ended up out in America as the governor of North Carolina. And what he was doing was actually transplanting people who had been his tenants in Carrick Fergus out to America, which is actually how the family of Andrew Jackson they went out. Ian Crozier, CEO of the Ulster Scots Agency based in Belfast. And we'll hear shortly how the Jackson family fared in America. But staying for the moment with President Jackson's ancestry, at this juncture it's worth mentioning that his parents were of Ulster Scots origin. So who exactly were the Ulster Scots? Historian and genealogist Brian Mitchell of the Tower Museum in Derry City. 
It is a, t- a term that is very familiar up here in Northern Ireland. Uh, in the United States, they would more often be known as Scotch Irish or Scots Irish. But essentially, they would be looked on as the descendants of mainly Scottish settlers of Presbyterian faith who settled in the northern part of Ireland throughout the 17th century. They would estimate that by about 1715, there was maybe 200,000 people with Scottish Presbyterian roots living in Northern Ireland. And by that, I would include the northern part of Ireland. It would include Cavan, Monan and Donegal as well. And they put down roots here. They were very much... I think they felt they were affected by uh, the penal laws as much as uh, the local Catholic population as well. The annals of history record that President Jackson's mother Elizabeth was a devout Presbyterian who deeply resented official discrimination against Presbyterians in Ireland. Matthew Warwick, education officer with the Ulster Scots Agency. Presbyterians suffered hardship, disadvantage, not not quite persecution, but... Uh, uh, they were certainly second-class citizens. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. Had to pay tithes to the local Anglican Church of Ireland Parish Church. Their weddings and baptisms were no longer seen as being legally binding after the 1704 Test Acts. But it wasn't just official religious discrimination which motivated the Jacksons to eventually emigrate to America. There was also the new world opportunity of owning their own land. Dr Patrick Fitzgerald, Head of Research and Development at the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies, based in the Ulster American Folk Park, situated near Oma in County Tyrone. One thing in that sense of opportunity that was a constant was this idea of breaking free of a regime in Ulster where you had to pay rent on a regular basis for your land to the idea that I might own my own farm. And farms that could be five, six, seven times the size of the small farms that they carved out here. So land was a constant fuel to this desire to seek a new life and new opportunities. Not just new opportunities for yourself, and most of the emigrants were relatively young, but thinking about their children and the next generation having better opportunities for material improvement in the new world. It was that economic opportunity, uh, that civil liberty, uh, freedom of conscience. Matthew Warwick. That drove the Ulster Scots, Scots Irish, across the sea in the early 18th century. And so seeking better opportunities in America... In the year 1765, the future president's family left their home in Carrickfergus and took a ship from the port of Larne in County Antrim to the New World. Here's Alistair Moore, a tour guide on board the Union Brig replica ship in the Ulster American Folk Park in County Tyrone to give a taste of what the typical 17th century emigrant's sea voyage to America was like. You were considered lucky if a ship like the Union made it to America within eight weeks of leaving Ireland. And that was with good sailing conditions. If the weather was bad, if the wind was against you, this journey could take anything up to 16 weeks. And however long it took, you're spending that time down here. These passengers do not have the luxury of being able to head up the steps to the top deck whenever they want some fresh air or some exercise. Depending on the weather conditions and the temperament of your captain, you might only get 10 10 minutes a day up on the top deck. It's impossible for us to really imagine what life was like for these passengers down here, contending with constant noise, boredom, frustration, fear, discomfort, and of course, smell. Because underneath every set of bunk beds, there was a bucket. And that was your toilet. It's a disgusting prospect. 200 human beings in a confined space like this filling those buckets. No privacy, no dignity, but you were delighted to have that bucket nearby because one of the worst aspects of this voyage is how even on the calmest of days, a ship like the Union was constantly rolling backwards, forwards, bobbing up and down. Seasickness affected virtually every single passenger. This was an appalling experience. And that's without mentioning just how unpleasant the food was or how many rats were down here or indeed how terrifying it was to be down here during a storm. You 
had to be tough mentally as well as physically just to survive an ordeal like this. But the Jacksons were lucky in one sense, and that they didn't travel alone. Ian Crozier of the Ulster Scots Agency. It wasn't just, you know, mum, dad and kids. It was mum, dad and kids, dad's brothers, mum's sisters. You know, it was the whole Entire extended community. family that was gone out. Which meant actually that then whenever they were over there, there was this kind of almost inbuilt support mechanism. So you ended up in a position where when Andrew Jackson's father died, now Jackson wasn't born here, he was born in America. In um, 1767, but, if I'm correct. Um, whenever his father died, then the mother and the young children went to live with her sister and their family that had come over from Ulster at the same time. So you had this kind of mutual... Because, of course, in those days, you did get... you. Know, Parents died, children died. You know, you had this kind of high mortality from frontier life, effectively. But the fact that it was a community that was transplanted meant that it was much more able to stand up to the rigors of all that. Just, just the same as they had in Ulster, they were able to do it in America. And of course, then when the the colonial governors saw them coming in, and they saw, oh, here's people coming from Ulster. They know how to handle themselves. So the dodgy pieces of ground in between you know where the Indians were and where the settlement was that's where they would be put you know the people who could fight were put into the dodgy space and as was just touched on Andrew Jackson's father died before he was born in 1767 as a result his widowed mother took him and his two brothers to live with nearby relatives so what kind of an upbringing did the young Andrew have? Graham Walton of the Andrew Jackson Cottage in Carrick, Fergus. He would have had a fairly hard upbringing. Um, his father's passed away before he's born. He's raised by his mother along with his two brothers. I suppose that what would have been a particularly tough time in the Americas with the Revolutionary War, or so the French Indian War and later on the Revolutionary Wars, both his brothers and his mother would eventually pass away from diseases caught. His two brothers would have fought in that war and caught diseases after being injured. His mother would eventually pass away through disease caught whilst treating soldiers. And Andrew himself would then have been raised by sort of further out family members. He himself had been like a runner or courier for the continental side and the and the wars, George Washington's side against yeah. the, the the empire against forces. The, yeah, against the the crown forces. Um, he was treated very very badly at one stage. Had been taken prisoner. Some English officer tried to get him to clean his boots. Um, he obviously acquired a hatred of the the crown forces at this stage, and this officer actually basically slashed him across the face with a sword and these scars Jackson would carry until his death. Um, Not only the physical scars, but the trauma the tra- and uh, all the issues that go with it. Yeah, yeah. And the attitude. And the attitude, um, which he seemed to have plenty of in his <laughs> later life. <laughs> because he was a real rebel, wasn't he? He goes on to have a very distinguished military career, am I correct? He does indeed. He becomes quite a, you know, a very well-known, very distinguished military leader. I think most famous for beating the English at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. And that was sort of been the highlight of his military career. So just how important was Jackson's victory at the 1815 Battle of New Orleans? Ian Crozier. If the Americans had lost at the Battle of New Orleans, America would have been maybe a third of the size of what it is today. Um, because you had a position where the British would have blocked the expansion of the country. You'd have ended up in a a position where most of the West would have been still held by the Mexicans. So, you know, basically winning at New Orleans cleared the way to the idea of a continental United States. 
Right, okay. you know, if the so Americans right. hadn't won it in New Orleans, there wouldn't have been a continental United States. It consolidated it the, the position. The, it would have been the east of the continent. Would have been what they would have been stuck with. That's what the British were trying to do. Um, so it's interesting as well that at New Orleans you actually had a commander of the Americans whose roots were in Ulster, Andrew and the, Jackson, and the British commander was, who was General Pakenham. And his roots were in Crumlin, which was only a few miles away from Carrick Fergus. Wow, hard to believe, isn't it? You know, and you had the same thing, um, you know, when Jackson's the, the hero of the of the, the War of eighteen twelve, um, the White House was burned to the ground by Robert Ross, who was from Ross Traver. You know, so it was people transplanted from here, fighting each other on a different continent. And so how exactly did Andrew Jackson end up becoming President of the United States in 1828? Graham Walton. He had been elected to Senate for a period. He did contest the 1828 presidential election and it was a huge landslide for him. Um, leave the at his inauguration he actually had to climb out of a window at the back of the White House and go and stay in a hotel um, because there's something like 20,000 people trying to get into the White House to you know to see this great man and he became known if I'm correct as King Mob because of that incident but this was a man who was very very popular loved by the masses and he kind of introduced the concept from right Graham called Jacksonian democracy democracy for the common person yeah, he was very much the people's president. He's actually the first president of the United States to have been born in a log cabin. So he very much came from the same background, I suppose, as the vast bulk of, the, of his supporters, followers, whatever you want to call him. Um, but yeah, very, very popular. Basically, the people's president he was seen as at that time. Andrew Jackson's presidency lasted from 1829 to 1837. So just how does history judge it? Dr. Daniel Geary, the Mark Pickett Professor of U.S. History at Trinity College, Dublin. Andrew Jackson was one of the most important presidents in American history. On the positive sides, he democratized American politics. He was sort of the first candidate to be associated with universal white male suffrage. Before Jackson, it was all about your parentage and your, you know, what stock you came from and how much money you had. How much After, blue blood, sort yeah, of thing. for sure. And after Jackson, every president looked for a log cabin in their backstory. That's what you needed then. And you see that now right the way through. It's the idea, you know, people love the story of somebody who comes from nothing to raise to the highest office in the land. Ian Crozier. Here's Daniel Geary once again. After Jackson's election really, you know, prizes candidates who can appeal to the common man, if you like, the Oscar Scott background is a helpful one because it proved that you weren't one of the elites, that you were one of the people. Jackson, you know, the idea of the outsider coming to clean up Washington, that was who Jackson was. He was a tough guy, and that, that would be how he got to the top. He more or less fought his way to the top, but he was nobody's fool either. Carrick Fergus based Jackson enthusiast Tom Bamber. He managed to get himself wangled into the office of president. And it's important to stress that Andrew Jackson was the first in a long line of US presidents who had strong ancestral links to Ulster. Patrick Fitzgerald of the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies in County Tyrone. I think Jackson is undoubtedly one of the better known of that group of Ulster American presidents. And I think one of the things that his career in the White House and his career in general uh, demonstrates is that actually the things that we remember about these men change with time. So I would argue, particularly in America, if you'd gone back to, say, uh, two generations ago in the 1950s, and asked at the average American, well, what about Andrew Jackson? The thing they'd probably remember about Jackson and was much celebrated was his career as a military man, a general. He had uh, whipped the Brits, if I can use that rather emotive term, in 1815 at the Battle of New Orleans. He was Old Hickory, this wonderful military figure who affirmed American independence at this early stage of the Republic. If we look to today, 
in America, I would say that's changed. And what people remember most now, I would argue, about Jackson is his record in relation to what is known to us as the Trail of Tears. Um, the Indian Removal Act, which was introduced under Jackson in the 1830, basically laid in place the mechanism for moving very large numbers of Native Americans, particularly the Cherokee, off their ancestral lands in the southeast of America, across the Mississippi, into the American West, places like Oklahoma. And that, as the name Trail of Tears implies, was not a good story. And it really does shine a very bright light on how Indian land rights were basically just totally ignored, um, not just in Jackson's time, but really you could argue across much of 19th century America. So that shows us in a way how the reframing of the story of how the American West was not won but lost uh, has changed the way we think about this and that Jackson's overall reputation has, I would argue, declined in America as a result of this rather sorry tale of how the American West was lost and how he had played an important role in one of the one of the less less lubrious aspects of, of that whole story. Right. And uh, he but he was the guy who really introduced populist democracy. Am I right, yeah. uh, Paddy? Yeah, I mean that's one the of the really, really populist president of of the American uh, politics. Absolutely. The political party system, as we know it in America, it emerged initially at the revolution, a two-party political system, and they changed somewhat. And it was during the uh, Jackson period, and as a result of Jackson's bid for the presidency, that the uh, party system changed. And, of course, we had the emergence of uh, what is the two-party system that exists today in the United States. County Kildare historian Seamus Cullen. Here's Matthew Warwick. Andrew Jackson, he was the seventh president of the United States, founder of what would become the Democratic Party. And perhaps the best place in Ireland to learn about the ancestry life and lore of President Andrew Jackson is the Andrew Jackson Cottage situated in Bonnie before Carrickfergus County Antrim. Graham Walton. The Andrew Jackson Cottage, you're very, very close to the ancestral home of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. Now, the original cottage, the original homestead was knocked down in 1860 to make way for the railway line which travels just behind us here. This cottage, um, to all intents and purposes, would have been the next door neighbours and dates back to a very, very similar period. Normally, when we're open for visitors, we will have a turf fire burning. A cottage isn't a cottage without a turf fire burning. Of course. Uh, so normally, we would have a, a the fire burning here. And we also have, I mean, it has two bedrooms. Um, the half loft, obviously, you know, winter, autumn, winter time for storing crops and so on. Spring, summer time, you've had some of the kids basically sleeping up there. I think the largest family we are aware of being raised in here had 10 children. Wow. So at some stage of 12 living in the cottage here. So there was no television in those days? No. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I mean, talk about a real community. You know, in a very, you know, in contrast to modern uh, houses, it's quite c- compact. But uh, for its time, that was the way it was done. Yeah, this, uh, this was just how it was traditionally um, I mean, as far as you know it's entirely possible this cottage just started off as the two rooms and as the Donaldsons developed their farm you know their income increased it, it would have been extend, you know, extended at either end and the great thing is that you know we kind of have a feeling now for how the actual Jacksons the next door neighbours yeah. lived during the time when he, they were here in the 18th century before they headed off to the new world and kind of it was a tough existence very physical am I right? Again? It would have been it's basically hard labour um, you know you don't have any machinery or so on you know to assist you with farming so sort of very hard existence very manual labour possibly quite a tough existence as well so I, you're right in the coastline here, you have all sorts of weather coming in at you, so possibly quite a hard existence down here in Bonnie before. We've come out to the back garden here now of the uh, Andrew Jackson Cottage, and I mean, wow, not only have you a garden, 
but you have a sight to beat all because we're looking just give our listeners a word picture of what we're looking at now the panoramic vista that's opened up before us here yeah when you step out the back of the cottage into the garden you have amazing views right up as far as Belfast um, not that far away from us or just less than a mile you have the beautiful Carrick Fergus Castle um, and it's a glorious day it is a beautiful day today um, it's really nice to work out here in days like this um, across the far side of the Belfast lock you have used to Hollywood, Bangor and so on it's just a beautiful place to work I mean it must have been something else for the families in times gone by that lived in the house here I mean I'd say you know if they whenever they moved away it must have been quite difficult because I mean let's be honest that view money couldn't buy it no money couldn't buy that view at all I'd say it is a beautiful spot here and you know moving away as the Jacksons did to go to the Carolinas you know they'd have got themselves back in a very tough life where you know wherever whatever land they've been allocated needs to be cleared and and got ready basically to farm um so what i mean for the reason that andrew jackson senior the president's father died so early in the new world yeah as far as we know and say probably a heart attack he's died of um but it is said that it was the hard work of clearing his new land which led to his early death but i mean they really had drive didn't they these people like the jacksons i mean within one generation one of them is president of the united states i mean phenomenal yeah i mean, I mean they, literally from whitewashed cottage here to the white house yeah, literally, um, the people from this area, which is why I think Arthur Dobbs encouraged them to, to go over there, were known for their hard work and their skills and so on. So that was why they were quite keen to get these people to, to settle, say, particularly over in the Carolinas. And to discover more about the island of Ireland ancestry of other US presidents, then make sure to catch our next number two programme in this seven-part Greening the White House series, when we'll be visiting the County Donegal-based ancestral homes of the 11th US President James Knox Polk and also the 15th US President James Buchanan. Until then, I'm going to leave the last word on Andrew Jackson with various contributors. Andrew Jackson became President of the United States of America and we actually have an Andrew Jackson Centre in Bonnie before in Carrick, Fergus. The Andrew Jackson Cottage, which is in Carrick, Fergus, is just about a mile from Carrick, Fergus Castle. It's a beautiful little thatched cottage. Andrew Jackson Centre, a centre to interpret the Andrew Jackson story. Jackson, a political giant, so people want to learn more about him can come and find out about, about him at the Andrew Jackson Cottage. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.